Good evening. My name is Ann Thornton, and I am Vice Provost and University Librarian at Columbia University. And I'm delighted to provide the welcome for this evening's program. In 2008, the Alexander Foundation generously donated $4 million to Columbia University Libraries to hire a Jewish Studies librarian and to support collections in Jewish Studies. Since that time, we were able to catalog and make available nearly all of our 1,600 Hebrew manuscripts, hire a full-time librarian focusing on Jewish studies, and ensure that Columbia University Libraries is internationally known for its Jewish studies collections. The annual Norman E. Alexander Lecture celebrates the Alexander Foundation's great gift to us and demonstrates our commitment to supporting the field of Jewish studies at Columbia and around the world. And I'd like to acknowledge Gail Benderman uh, of the Norman uh, e. Alexander Foundation, who is the daughter of Norman E. Alexander, who is here this evening. Thank you so much, Gail, for being here, for your support. Ms. Michelle Chesner, the Norman E. Alexander Librarian for Jewish Studies, will introduce tonight's speaker. Michelle. Thank you, Anne. I'll add to our thanks um, for the lovely Norman E. Alexander Library bags that you'll see over on the right side. And feel free to take. Um, take them with you. Um, David Ruderman is the Joseph Meyerhoff Professor of Modern Jewish History at the University of Pennsylvania. He was also the Ella Darivoff Director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania from 1994 to 2014. He's the author of many books and articles, most recently a best-selling best Hebrew book of the modern era, the Book of the Covenant of Pinchas Horowitz and its remarkable legacy in 2004. Professor Ritterman has served on the board and as vice president of the Association of, Association of Jewish Studies and on the boards of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the Journal of Reform Judaism, and the, Rena the Renaissance Society of America, and the World Union of Jewish Studies. And his influence on the world of Jewish studies and beyond is well known. Last year, 31 of his colleagues and former students presented him with Jewish Culture in Early Modern Europe, Essays in Honor of David B. Ruderman, as a testament to his great work and achievements. Without further ado, I am pleased to present to you Professor David Ruderman, who will speak at tonight's Norman E. Alexander Lecture on Jewish Studies on Missionaries, Mishumadim, and Maskilim, an entangled history of Christians, Jews, and those in between in 19th century Europe. Professor Ruder. I do want to thank uh, uh, the Columbia Library and Michelle in particular for this wonderful invitation. Uh, it is an honor to be the Norman Alexander uh, Lecturer in Jewish Studies and I thank Gail for uh, her enormous uh, stewardship of this wonderful uh, gift to Columbia and to the Jewish people. Um, I, uh, it, is, it is really great to be back at Columbia. I actually uh, have a master's from Gershon Cohn, uh, who at that time was the professor of Jewish history. Uh, and I recall, I, mean, I just walked around before. Uh, it's amazing, this place hasn't changed in 50 years, at least uh, not on the surface. Um, and I just felt the ghosts of all my teachers uh, were, were all around here. Uh, and it looks like uh, the, the the architecture, that the, the hasn't been much refurbishing in the last 50 years either. I didn't notice it, and that, maybe I wasn't looking very carefully. Um, in any case, uh, it did bring back memories. Uh, in the course of, uh, after I began my studies here at Columbia, uh, Gerson Cohn uh, announced that he was no longer going to uh, study Jewish history, he was going to make Jewish history by becoming chancellor of the Jewish Logical Seminary uh, across the street. And uh, he had a, a very distinguished career and had a great impact upon my life. Um, but that's all in the past, and now I am here uh, 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 back at Columbia, and it's, it, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm speaking about a new subject for me. Uh, those of you who know my work know that I'm an early modernist, so therefore jumping into the 19th century and even moving as far as Eastern Europe from Western Europe is, is quite a stretch. Uh, but you know, when you get to be an old age, you know, and an old guy, you know, an altecocker, as we say, um, 
Well, what the hell? I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, just you're having a good time. Do your thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, as like many other things, uh, this subject came to me as a result of, of reading a footnote. Um, I once wrote a book on a convert uh, after I read Elie Shever Karlbach's uh, book on converts, and uh, I, uh, I found a footnote of a, of a convert she hadn't done enough on, and I wrote a whole book on him after that. But she stimulated me, uh, as I told her. Uh, and similarly, uh, the last book that uh, uh, Michelle mentioned, a book about a Hebrew bestseller uh, from the 18th century, uh, in tracing its steps into the 19th and 20th century, uh, I discovered uh, this handsome man over here, he's not a Jew, uh, Alexander McCall, uh, and his beautiful wife, I'm gonna show you his whole family in a second, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, there was a big affair going on here, there was something really happening in the 19th century that, that so, somehow intrigued me. So I began uh, to investigate, and this has become uh, a, uh, a subject of the last year, and a little more. So this is clearly a work in progress. I'm not there yet, uh, but I'm about to launch uh, a, a larger project. And at least what I want to try to do is show you, uh, in the course of the next 40 minutes or so, uh, why this subject is so intriguing and why, and why it might interest uh, uh, a number of people here. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else I should say before I begin, so why don't I just launch in. And uh, Michelle is kindly going to uh, show you a few slides. I'm not going to rely that I'm not a PowerPoint person, but I, I, there's so many great pictures. When you go into the 19th century, as opposed to the early modern period, all of a sudden the documentation and the pictures uh, uh, just uh, hit you in the face so you, uh, you can't ignore. So I just want to show you, he had a lot of family. He, was, he took very seriously the commandment of uh, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and they all look kind of, uh, you know, um, English, uh, I don't know how else to describe them. Uh, recall Elizabeth Ann McCall Finn, she is very important, I'll talk about her in a second. So that's enough for now. Let me begin uh, with an overall introduction. We live in a time of scholarship when most of the taboos that the, about the study of the Jewish past have been removed. This is especially dramatic with respect to the study of Jewish converts. Uh, defined disparagingly as mishumadim in Jewish tradition, and even in traditional Jewish scholarship. Those apostates who have left the Jewish faith, often treated outside the pale of Jewish civilization. Uh, or as oddities who became famous or notorious by overcoming their Jewish particularity. Or as self-hating Jews who end up as adversaries of their former co-religionists. But this has all changed in recent years, particularly uh, the scholarship of Todd Endelman. Uh, only last year, his uh, large book on, uh, on Jewish converts has come out. Uh, I should mention uh, a former student of mine, Eli Schenker, uh, who also has a forthcoming book from, uh, from Stanford about, uh, about Russian Jewish converts. Of course, Eli Sheva Karbach, we mentioned, Yaakov Deutsch, uh, and, and a whole group of others who have really created a whole field of the study of the convert. Um, on the other hand, the figure of the missionary is a subject relatively untouched by historians of Jewish cultural and social history. Uh, however, it is studied in great intensity by historians of the church, missions, and this is in itself a vast historical enterprise. Missionaries as cultural brokers uh, in post-colonial literature and studies of European imperialism and subaltern peoples uh, have, uh, is also a very important subject of studying the 19th and 20th century. But this is hardly a broad subject for Jewish historians. Uh, of course, in the 19th century, the primary group of missionaries were the London missionaries called the London Society uh, for the, gotta get the title right, for the persuasion uh, of Jews for, uh, no, 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 I'll, I'll get it in a second. I was gonna say for the conversion of the Jews, but it's not the, that's not the exact title. Uh, they were active in London throughout the 19th and into the 20th century, uh, and they had a vast empire of, uh, of, con of, of missionaries all over Europe, uh, and uh, clearly they are the background. And we have uh, some work on this London society. Uh, Mel Scott, many years ago, wrote a small book on the subject. Raphael Mahler, the Israeli historian, 
Uh, and more recently, uh, Yisrael Bartal has a very interesting article about uh, these London missionaries and Chabad. Uh, uh, don't ask me how they're connected, but they are, uh, or uh, they, were, they were certainly, they tolerated each other. Uh, and there is a young Polish woman who I've learned a great deal from, named, uh, and if I can pronounce her name correctly, Agnieszka uh, Jagodczynska, who is now writing an entire uh, book. It is actually finished in Polish on um, uh, the London uh, Society in Poland, uh, dealing obviously with Polish Jewry. And you'll hear more about that in a second. Uh, I want to focus on one individual, and you've seen his picture already, and these are, of course, his family. Um, Alexander McCall. I choose him not only because he was a key intellectual and political leader of the society, but one of its most profound intellectuals, deeply learned in Jewish literature and intimately familiar with contemporary Jews and Judaism, as you will see. Educated in the West, living in the East, he spent 10 years in Warsaw, a conversant in Hebrew and Yiddish, and deeply committed to Jewish learning while acutely critical of the Talmud and Jewish law and the rabbis, McCall represents a remarkable case study of a dialectical relationship of love and hate, intense devotion to his subjects while derogating the very core of their beliefs. He demonstrates profoundly the rich complexity of his mindset and entanglements with Jews and Judaism. So I'm going to, so here, I, I, I guess the title of my talk is a little bit false advertising. I'm going to really speak about one missionary and not missionaries, although London Society, there are a lot, but I, I think he's both typical and, as you will see, very atypical. Uh, at the same time, I'm going to mention two of his accolades, two Mishumadim, so you get two, so that's plural, right? Uh, one of them will come up especially uh, because of, of, of what he does with relation to McCall. Uh, and the Maskilim are going to come in at the end. In other words, most of my project now has been focused on the missionary himself, but I want to show you the long term where this project is going. And the Maskilim who respond to McCall are, make it such an interesting uh, story. In other words, it's not, it is really a, a very broad conversation going on within the context of uh, European Jewish history of the 19th century. It is also transnational. Because we're speaking about a, a guy who's born uh, uh, in, uh, in, in London, in, uh, or actually practices in London, is born in Ireland, um, but clearly spends his time in Eastern Europe and goes back and forth. Uh, and therefore, we are speaking about a cause celebre, perhaps not as great as the Damascus blood libel of, of 1840, uh, and in terms of its enormous ramifications throughout Europe, um, which, of course, Jonathan Frankel has documented so brilliantly. Uh, but it is a, a, a minor cause celebre because it involves both Christians and Jews throughout all of Europe, as you will see. And therefore, it became a conversation or a revival of the Jewish-Christian debate in the 19th century in a very different form and in a very exciting way uh, that was so how compelling I, I couldn't put it down, as you will see. Uh, so I'm going to speak mostly about McCall, but I'm going to, after giving you a, a, a sense of him, I'm going to move on to talk about uh, a little bit about his about his uh, Mishum Adim, his uh, his converts, the few that he did succeed in converting, uh, and then I want to talk about the Maskilic response and and show you what the whole picture might look like when I eventually get done uh, uh, writing this book. Uh, but it, it, at, at this stage, of course, I'm still a long way to go. Let me introduce my subject of McCall with three snapshots, uh, each offering a distinct and different aspect uh, of this man. Lund Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. That's the exact title, okay? I slipped it, but that's what we're talking about. In a eulogy written by Reverend William Ayerst, one of McCall's close disciples, who dedicated one of his own works to his teacher, this was written in 1863, he points out the uniqueness of McCall in contrast to other Christians who had previously devoted their lives to the study of Judaism. McCall was different from John Lightfoot, the great scholar of the biblical text who studied the rabbis merely to comprehend the Bible more deeply, says Ayerst. Uh, he was also different from Wagenseil, an Eisenmanger, whose fiery darts, Pugio Fide, denigrated Jews and Judaism. Uh, instead, 
He approached the Jews he met and their literature, which he consumed, with a new spirit of love and goodwill. Here I'm paraphrasing Ayerst. Uh, in this sense, he was unique and opened up new channels of communication between Christians and Jews. So interestingly, this uh, Christian paints McCall within the context of the history of Christian apologetics towards Jews, and he distinguishes between, on the one hand, the biblical exegete, and on the other hand, uh, those who came out strongly with all of their storm against Judaism and Jewish texts, here is a Christian who approaches Jews with love and devotion, all right? And we will explore that uh, equation in a second. My second uh, uh, introductory snapshot is totally different. And here I get a chance to introduce one of my Mishumadim. Very interesting figure, Stanisla Hoga, H-O-G-A. Uh, and I don't have a picture of him, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna point any pictures yet. Um, Stanislaw Hoga um, is uh, well known. Uh, Sid Lyman, many years ago, uh, in one of his many articles, uh, uh, wrote uh, on this man and tried to reconstruct a story which he then showed was not true, and he was absolutely right. But the story is even more elaborate than uh, Sid Lyman described. Uh, Stanislaw Hoga was, as you will see, the translator of uh, McCall's famous work, which I will introduce very, very soon, uh, called The Old Path, or Nitivot Olam in Hebrew, he translated it into Hebrew, which was this very strong polemic against the Talmud. Uh, so Hoga became, was an Eastern European Jew who became a convert and worked with uh, McCall uh, very, very uh, intensely for many years. But when he came to England, uh, after this book had appeared in the middle of the, uh, of, of the uh, 19th century, Hoga begins to write books against his former teacher. In a work which he called Sir Ne'eman, or The Faithful Missionary, a work written long after he had converted to Protestantism and had allegedly worked on the notorious translation of McCall's magnum opus, as I mentioned, um, uh, he uh, clearly had distanced himself and his association from the London Society in general and McCall in particular. This complex apostate apparently had second thoughts. He did not wish to return to the Jewish fold as some had suggested, nor did he want to make peace with the community he had long deserted. But he believed that Jews like him could find a space within the Christian faith by simultaneously holding on to their customs and practices. Rabbinic halacha did not deserve the rebuke McCall had given it. That's unbelievable he would write that after translating a text which is 500 pages of rebuke of the Talmud and the rabbis. He attacked the incompetent and insincere missionaries of the London Society and made light of McCall's claim that he had directly created Reform Judaism, which is another interesting uh, thing that we will, hopefully will come back to, Reform Judaism in, in England at least. He also implied that McCall was hardly the sole author of Nativot Olam in the first place. So uh, the, 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 even more ironic that he should be writing this anti-Talmudic text and now repudiating it entirely. While maintaining his belief in Jesus, he would not repudiate the rabbinic understanding of Judaism. So we have here a fascinating reversal and transformation as a religious thinker. And I, I've actually traced uh, Hoga's steps. He wrote several other books. Um, and believe it or not, he was published throughout the 1850s in the Jewish Chronicle. So even though they knew he was an apostate, they were, he was still a very learned Jew. Uh, and they published him there, and he talks about all kinds of interesting things, uh, mostly biblical interpretations. Um, but clearly, it was a very open world. Uh, but as you see already, my, my interest, uh, those of you that know some of my previous work, uh, mingle identities or uh, braided identities uh, is something that I find absolutely fascinating here. Here is a Jew who converts, but nevertheless holds on to so much of his Jewish uh, identity, particularly uh, his relationship to halacha, to Jewish law. Uh, we perhaps will come back to him a little later on. So my second testimony then is a rebuke of McCall by his former disciple, uh, Stanislaw Hoga. 
One more uh, snapshot, uh, and this has recently come to me. Um, one of the great uh, joys of this project was spending a month in Oxford working in, believe it or not, an entire archive of the London Society. Uh, it's all there. I mean, these missionaries, uh, you know, they, maybe they had only one or two Jews that were converting, but they had 10 boxes of material on those two Jews. I mean, they were, they documented themselves, they took themselves quite seriously, um, and it is really unbelievable the amount of material that is there. So in a manuscript, Oxford, uh, 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 an Oxford manuscript, in a letter penned by McCall from Poland to the Reverend C.J. Hawtrey in London, 1826. This was during the period when McCall was stationed in Warsaw. Uh, he discusses the details of preparing a translation of the Old Testament for the Lund Society and relating how he had paid a Jew to read and correct their translation until the Jew's wife complained and was forced to cease his work. Uh, she obviously didn't like uh, her husband doing the work of the Lund Society. He mentions parenthetically how he arrived in Berlin to purchase some prized Hebrew books. And then all of a sudden, he's no longer talking about his missionary activity, but rather he is talking about Jewish books and how he loves them and how he has found a remarkable sale. He mentions he got a Kabbalah de Nudata, this remarkable work of Christian Hebraicism, this anthology of Kabbalistic texts uh, uh, in, uh, in Latin. Uh, and he purchased it for a song uh, and then he talks about, he also was able to acquire the Shevet Yehuda of Ibn Verga uh, and Isaac Troki's Chizuk Emona, which is a, a, an unbelievable anti-Christian work, which he claims he needs to write a response to. He prides himself on purchasing these books for the London Society Library in Warsaw for an excellent price. He is excited that books are a part of his cultural world, uh, and he wants to share this with his Christian uh, colleague in London. So in the end, who is the real McCall? This is a little elaborate introduction, I know, but I, 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 I think each little snapshot gives you a taste of it. Um, was he a unique Christian with a genuine love for Jews and Judaism? Uh, or was he a deceiver and imposter who denigrated the rabbis unfairly? Or was he a sincere Hebraist who greatly valued the learning of the Jews for its own sake? And I guess my answer is perhaps, perhaps uh, he was simultaneously all three. So that is where I am going. Now the basic outline of McCall's distinguished career is easily constructed from the standard history of, of London society of, of, uh, of a man named Gidney, from the numerous references of McCall in the annual minutes of the society uh, extant in the archives of the Bothian Library that I mentioned, uh, in the journal called Jewish Intelligence, uh, which is a remarkable uh, uh, um, a testimony to the activities of these missionaries and their awareness of Jews, and particularly from the warm reminiscences of his daughter, Mrs. Elizabeth Finn, the one in the corner which I'm coming to right away. Uh, McCall also wrote many books, at least 50 books, and I'll show you them in a second, sermons and other addresses, and from references to him on the part of many contemporaries, particularly those associated with the society during his lifetime, including the uh, eulogies, one of them I've already mentioned. In other words, he was a figure of an enormous stature within this missionary world, holding very important clerical and educational offices and eventually a distinguished uh, professorship at King's College. I tried, I told my colleague, uh, I, I, I believe it or not, I went online at King's College and there is such a thing called the Alexander McCall Scholarship in the Religious Studies Department and I have a colleague, uh, uh, um, uh, Andrea Schatz, who teaches there and I wrote to her and I said, uh, could I apply for that scholarship? I thought it would really be appropriate. Uh, and I, of course, I could not, but I'm, I, well, I hope to give a, a lecture on McCall. I think it's really cool. He was a professor of Bible and Judaic studies uh, at King's College for many years. Uh, let me give you in a paragraph, I'm gonna stop reading this in a second. I have it in front of me and I, I don't like to read, but I'm, as you see, I'm doing it kind of. Uh, and then I, I wanna sort of move on and show you some slides. McCall was born at Dublin in May, uh, on May 16th, 1799, and he died at London in 1863. Educated at Trinity College, Dublin, he was sent as a missionary to Poland in 1821, where he studied Hebrew Yiddish and rabbinics. He continued to live in Warsaw for nearly 10 years, interesting the Grand Duke Constantine, the Crown Prince of Prussia, 
and Sir Henry Rose and his work. Um, what is really interesting, and I think uh, um, uh, this has been pointed out by others, uh, the political function of these missionaries uh, and their relationship with the Russian government and how they have won them over uh, and clearly how uh, Haskalah or in Jewish enlightenment in Eastern Europe becomes intertwined with missionary activity uh, and how insensitive uh, or unaware, let's put it that way, the Orthodox Jewish community is of this entanglement while those who need to, do, uh, to separate the two are the Maskilim. In other words, that's giving you a, a picture of what, what, what I'm going to come to. The Maskilim are the ones that are going to end up defending rabbinic tradition, not the Orthodox who, couldn't, who are, are oblivious. Uh, and that is a certain irony in itself as well, but we, we will come back to that. In 1837, he produced, uh, initially as installments, uh, his elaborate attack upon the Talmud called The Old Paths. Over a whole year, every week, uh, another installment was published. It was published, uh, and then finally, uh, this evoked considerable interest on the part of the Jews and was translated into several languages, um, including Hebrew. Uh, Nitivot Olam, of course, is the Hebrew edition by Stanislaw Hogue, as we mentioned, who apparently claimed to perform more than a mere translation, as we've already seen. McCall wrote vigorously against the Damascus blood libel. Here he shows his love and affection for the Jews, and I will show you that in a second, demonstrating his profound respect for the high moral standard of Jews. He also, as we said, became a professor of Hebrew and wrote many works on, uh, on Jewish subjects. Um, now, what I want to do is to give you a little taste of this. Uh, first of all, let's... Um, so, so this is his family. Uh, uh, Michelle, go on to the next one. Let me see what I got here. Uh, more children, sorry. I, I didn't get Emily and Louisa. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but uh, now, all right, now we come to Mrs. Finn. So Mrs. Finn uh, was married to James Finn. Um, and he became uh, the chief missionary of the Linn Society in Jerusalem. So there is a whole Jerusalem story to this. Uh, a professor named Perry at the University of Haifa has written a whole book uh, on, on, a on aspects of this missionary role. Mrs. Finn uh, wrote a, a wonderful uh, diary in which she talks at, quite, at great length about her father. So I just want to give you a taste of this. I don't think I have the time to read too much, but I just want to give you a little bit of a taste. My father took very great pains to become thoroughly acquainted with the Jewish character and mode of life. He found that among them, learning was everything and wealth nothing. It was thought an honor to be the wife of a learned man. I remember well the Yiddish phrase I so often heard in my childhood. Now she claims that McCall spoke to her only in Hebrew and Yiddish. And they wrote to each other in Hebrew and Yiddish. Again, this is missionaries. So uh, I, I, again, say to yourself, you know, so these are good Christians, right? There is a dividing line between Christianity and Judaism. But my claim in arguing for mingle identities is it's not so clear. It's never so clear because life is, is not so clear. Um, she, I remember well the Yiddish phrase I so often heard in my childhood, er, uh, er is er a gelernte man, uh, as the highest praise uh, in Poland, McCall met with 15 boys, she tells us, who were acquainted with Talmudic literature. My father met with a lad who could put a pin through the leaves of a Pentateuch and cite the words. My father was familiar with the law of Moses and the cursive writing of Hebrew, which is different from the square characters that we see in printed books or in the rolls uh, uh, of the law. He wrote out the whole of the five books eight times with his own hand. He also taught me the cursive writing, and I continually get letters written to him. Here it is, the language being either pure Hebrew or Yiddish. He goes, she goes on to describe principal Jewish towns, among them Berdyshev, where the greatest number of Jews lived. Traveling was difficult. He slept in barns. Uh, he ate with the horses. Uh, he ate potatoes and honey uh, on Shabbat in a Jewish inn. He received Jewish visitors in, in Warsaw. And it was the stories about his intimate relationship with Jews is just as fascinating as, as his scholarship, as you will see. Um, and then, of course, she speaks about the first convert uh, a Jewish lady which the Grand Duke wanted baptized in the palace. But his major prize was, next slide, Avram Yaakov Schwarzenberg. Uh, now, and here's an opportunity to introduce my second Mishumad. This guy, Moses Margoliot, maybe some of you who work on 19th century have heard of before. 
because Margoliot uh, was, a, again, another Eastern European Jew who came to uh, England, and there he was baptized as a Protestant, uh, and then he began writing books on Jewish history. He is the quintessential uh, historian of Anglo Jewry in the 19th century. He wrote a three volume work, but he wrote actually more than that. He wrote several other works on, uh, on uh, Anglo Jewish history in which he saw it as his own history. He also wrote on the Bible. He was interested in poetics. He was fascinated by Sephardic Jewish literature, as many 19th century Ashkenazic Jews were. Uh, and he spent his whole career uh, writing uh, uh, about uh, Jewish literature. Uh, for him, he was a good Christian in every uh, form or shape, but nevertheless, culturally, ethnically, he saw himself as a Jew, uh, and therefore, again, we have this, uh, this very interesting uh, connection between Judaism on the part of someone who has given up uh, his, his religion, but nevertheless sees himself uh, as the one that needs to tell the story of Anglo Jewry. Now, in his account, this is about Schwarzenburg. Uh, he lived from upwards of 20 years and so on and so on. Uh, and then now uh, he talks about his deathbed, recants his Christian profession of faith, and he re uh, by repeating the words here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, the, Lord, uh, the Lord our God is, is one God. The Jews of Warsaw were therefore on the, the qui vive when the vital spark in that venerable Israelite indeed was about to quit the mortal frame. Uh, beautiful uh, 19th century English. They crowded the dying saint's chamber what were his last words on earth to be? Brethren, you wish to know in what faith I am dying? Every drop of blood in me were vocal and bound with speech. Each such drop would cry aloud that I am dying full of joy and peace, believing the redemption of Israel through the Lord Jesus. What is interesting about this character is that he insisted on dressing as he was. In other words, he refused to uh, take off his beard, uh, and he wore his yarmulke, uh, and he had his tzitzis, uh, and nevertheless, this was uh, a, 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 the, the convert, uh, Rabbi Abraham Jacob Schwarzenberg. Um, going on uh, very quickly, I'm not going to, I don't want to read too much more, uh, but um, she, she goes on to describe then, we're back uh, to Elizabeth Finn. Uh, Father began writing a series of papers to show how rabbis had departed from the Mosaic law, and this of course became the old paths. Uh, he using the motto of the words of the prophet Jeremiah, exhorting his people to look back to the old paths. The papers took the form of a double page in English with Hebrew quotations from the Talmud and the Bible. They were widely distributed and excited much attention for about a year. One result, she claims again, and this comes up uh, or a second time, was the founding of what she called Reform Judaism. A Jewish gentleman was sent to my father to verify his Hebrew quotations from the books in the library. It was in that way that Mr. Mark's congregation was began. Reverend Marx was the first rabbi of the Reform congregation in London. Um, that is a, a claim which he makes. Interestingly enough, Hoga makes fun of the claim and says it's ridiculous. He, he had no uh, impact whatsoever or very minimal impact on the reformed Jews. But be that as it may, she sees it. One little bit more detail and I'll finish with her. Um, but first of all, uh, the next slide. So here are some of the editions of, of the old past, 1837, uh, 1886. 2012, uh, and I'm going to show you in a second uh, uh, um, uh, Amazon where we're going to see every one of these books. I mean, I, I, I can't keep my books in print, but Alexander McCall's books are all in print and they're all on the internet. I mean, you obviously somebody is still reading them. Ah, so here's the German edition, and here's the Hebrew in the Tivot Olam, okay? Um, uh, so, Be'ir uh, Habira, London, and so on. Um, okay. Um, Father gave her Hebrew lessons. She slept one night in her father's study, and there I found on the bookshelves volumes of Schlegel Shakespeare in German. Uh, interesting that a London missionary is reading uh, Shakespeare in German. And this has been explained to me that indeed there was something more elegant about the German translation than the original, at least from the perspective of, uh, of 19th century Europeans. In the early morning, I read Romeo and Juliet, a mid midnight, uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and others in German. This was my first acquaintance with Shakespeare. So I, it has nothing to do with anything, but I just thought it was really cool. Um, okay, now let me show you the other works. So here is his translation of uh, the Book of Common Prayer. So you see you can daven in their, uh, the Christian missionary setup in a place which they call Palestine Pla Place in London. Uh, they would have uh, Friday night services and this would be their prayer book, go on. 
Um, and here is a, a remarkable book, Sketches of Judaism and the Jews. Uh, and there are several editions, but again, look, 2012 with pretty pictures and so on. Uh, this is his uh, essay. Uh, you will hear about Reform Judaism is in there. I'm going to talk about women in a second. That is in there as well. Um, his description of his visits among the Hasidim in Eastern Europe are in there. And believe it or not, there are loving portraits. I mean, as you will see, uh, the love in that first uh, uh, text that I gave you uh, does come through, in, especially in this book. Uh, and uh, go a little farther. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, I want to speak very briefly about this book later on. But a as an early modernist, uh, Isaac Roby de Castro, of course, uh, puts us in 17th century Amsterdam. Uh, this is. Um, a work in response to the English translation of a converso who wrote an anti-Christian uh, work, Isaac Arobio de Castro. And believe it or not, to show you how much uh, Jewish history intermingles, the translator was none other than Grace Aguilar. Uh, I hope you know who she is. She's a very famous uh, 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 woman novelist uh, of Jewish books of the 19th century uh, that have been studied by several scholars in England. Uh, and she was out there translating a Sephardic work and of course, McCall noticed it and wrote a two volume response. Uh, so we have the 17th century now invading uh, the 19th century. Um, and uh, I think that's all for now, except um, uh, let, let's uh, go on to the next one. Let me see where I am. OK. Oh, yeah. So I want to show you, you can buy these all. I, I'm, I'm not an agent from McCall, but look, they're all, every one of these, you can, OK, keep, keep going. Um, all right. So now we come to this. Um, so here is a very interesting part of our story, well docked by Jonathan Frankel as well. Uh, in the midst of this extraordinary crisis where Jews are accused again of the blood libel in Damascus, uh, and newspapers are covering this all over Europe, uh, McCall stands up to write his own work charging that these uh, accusations are totally false. Uh, I, I'm not going to read this with you. I mean, you can see this from the title. Keep going now, 1840. Uh, there is, I repeat, no evidence whatsoever, et cetera, et cetera. Go on. Uh, a list. So what is really interesting about this is that he constructs a community of Jewish Christians, uh, a list of competent witnesses approving of his work. Here are the persons neither afraid nor ashamed to give their names. We're going to stick our necks out and defend the Jews uh, and, and this baseless charge of uh, using uh, blood for, uh, to make uh, matzah. Go on. We, the other side by nations, Jews, notice how this is framed, and having lived in the years of maturity in the faith and practice of modern Judaism, but now by the grace of God, members of the Church of Christ who solemnly protest that we have never directly nor indirectly heard of much, and so on. Go on. And here are the names. And there, of course, is Moses Margoliot right there, and a whole group of other names. Some of them I can recognize, some of them I can't. Uh, but very Jewish Ashkenazic names. These are the prizes of the London Society of individuals who uh, they succeeded in converting. Uh, but all of them, you see where, where, where they're born, Kurland and, uh, uh, and Poland and uh, Hungary and so on and so forth, all of them are now Christians and now take their stand in defending their former co-religionists. Uh, go on. Uh, and here are some more names. Uh, and and uh, so you see there, there's already a community which uh, stand behind McCall, uh, and not necessarily large, but nevertheless uh, quite impressive in terms of the names that he's accumulated. Um, OK. Um, now what I want to do, uh, and I, I, so I want to mention, in addition to all of these works, uh, McCall translated uh, one of the commentaries of David Kimchi's uh, work on the Bible, uh, a translation, numerous sermons and addresses. Um, clearly, uh, uh, there are other works uh, in his sermons. There is so much Jewish learning and so many citations from rabbinic literature. Um, but what I want to do now is, r rather quickly, because I'm going to run out of time, or I'm, I didn't, wasn't even aware when I started, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to do this rather quickly. Um, I want to give you a taste of some of the arguments before we leave this. And again, I have the, all of these texts, but we're not going to have time to read them, but I, I just want to show you. So basically, the argument of Nitivot Olam is very wise in the sense that he uses two tactics in order to win over the Jews. Basically, he says he loves the Jews. He cares about their fate deeply. The problem is those damn rabbis who are messing everything up. 
If only they could see the truth of their Judaism through a Christian lens, they would appreciate, of course, uh, the grandeur of their own religiosity, and they would come forward to confess uh, their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, that's not a novel argument at all. I mean, there are, there are hundreds of years of this kinds of argumentation. But as you will see, the praise is really quite powerful, as I'll, I'll give you, show you one example. The other argument that he uses is he knows that uh, most uh, Christian exegetes have used midrashic texts or Kabbalistic texts to prove their case. Uh, and this is the easy way out. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, rabbis say everything when they start telling stories and homilies, and you can find anything. You know, uh, uh, the Messiah is at the gate of uh, Rome. Uh, that must be Jesus, of course, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he says, I'm not going to use those texts. Rather, I'm going to use the Shulchan Aruch or the codes, uh, particularly the Turim. Uh, in other words, I'm going to use Jewish halacha or I'm going to use the prayer book. Um, that is the standard liturgy of... Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jews in London, translated by another uh, character in one of my previous books. It's so wonderful to work on a book and then discover a character from another book, you know? It's as if they're all connected. Uh, David Levy, who was a very important translator of Hebrew text into English at the end of the 18th century. So he's going to use David Levy's prayer book, which is the kosher prayer book. If indeed the Jews are davening this stuff, then they must believe it, right? How can you say it's false or it's, it's, it's tangential or, or it's peripheral to their own experience. Uh, now, uh, uh, let's go. Um, so here, here is the nobility of Jewish culture. Uh, what's really interesting here is, um, I'm, I'm going to just skip down. Notice he talks about the Jewish printing presses. Those of you interested in the history of the book, uh, he's aware of them all. 19th century is a great period of, of the Jewish printing press. Uh, send forth a, a number of new works every year. Indeed, whether we look at the rabbinic Jews of ancient and modern times, we must admit that they are a people of no mean intellectual power. Let anyone reflect on the Jewish history, let him remember that for nearly 1,800 years they have been an outcast, wandering, persecuted, and oppressed people, and he will find it, it little short of a miracle next that the Jews should have any literature at all. But when he looks at the extent of that literature, its variety, and no monuments, etc., etc., uh, he must admit that there is, in the confirmation of the Jewish mind, an innate love of learning, an you know, um, aid of nobility and irresistible elasticity. You, you can read it yourself. But uh, he, he really likes the Jews. I mean, is he just doing this to, to show off? I mean, I mean, there's something about, he, he, he was impressed by the experience that he had living among Eastern European Jews for nine to 10 years. Um, at the same time, go on to the next one. This is harder to read. I'm not going to go through this all, but uh, on the other hand, of course, the standard arguments. So here is, of course, the intolerance, the double morality that Jews like Jews better than they like non-Jews. Uh, the, the Noahide commandments are not equal to the Jewish, uh, and uh, he gives uh, many examples, and here is one. So this is his commentary on Shvo Hamatcha, you know, from the Passover Haggadah, pour out your wrath on the, the heathens, and he said, you know, it's one thing to talk about heathens as he goes on here, but we beautiful Protestants in England, I mean, why would we be, uh, why, why should we be victimized by that wrath? I mean, what's going on here? We're a different kind of Christian. No, notice, I mean, a very typical Protestant stance, you know, the bad guys are the Catholics, uh, poppery, and the good guys, of course, are, are, are the Protestants. And therefore, uh, he, 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 the, for him, this is hypocrisy. I'll go on to the next one. Um, all right, so now here are two themes which come out, which do reflect much more than a 19th century kind of context. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but what he spends a great deal of time on is talking about how halacha destroys economically poor Jews and how we open up our kitchens to them, but those damn rabbis won't allow them to take our bread because it's not kosher. And therefore, they starve in the streets of London. Of course, there was, there was a lot of poor Jews in the 19th century in London. So indeed, he, he constantly harps back to the fact that the people that are impoverished are those who are the poor who experience uh, um, uh, the, the tyranny, the so-called tyranny of the halacha. Uh, the next one. Um, now, of course, the other theme is women. Uh, there's a lot of missionary texts that deal with women. Uh, so this is not so atypical of the 19th century at all, as I discover. 
uh, it, it looks like feminism, but it is already something that's been going on for, for quite a long time. Again, I don't want to read through it all, but uh, the spirit of rabbinism is, is, it, it is which degrades womanhood and does not suffer to exercise the faculties which God has given. Rabbinism lays it down as an axiom that the study of the law of God is no part of a woman's duty and that to teach his daughters the word of God is no part of paternal obligation. Women and slaves are exempt from the study of the law. Go on. Um, and so he goes through this whole thing. Uh, rabbinism teaches that a woman is unfit to give uh, uh, legal evidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, this is all against standard, but nevertheless, uh, it appears uh, 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 in full form. And here, notice Il Chotam with Torah, quoting uh, 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 from uh, from the Mishnah Torah. Go on. Uh, Rabbinism excludes women from being counted as part of the synagogue, uh, or chayim and daily prayers. Notice the sources that he's using, and so on. Rabbinism teaches that to be a woman uh, is as great a degradation as to be a heathen or a slave and provides the same form of thanksgiving, and so on. Now, that, of course, uh, is, again, standard tropes. But what I want to show you, which I think is quite incredible, um, uh, is uh, the following. In sketches, um, we have a long discussion of a book that he discovers of Tchines, uh, these women's prayers, which in recent years Chava Weisler has made famous in her book, uh, telling uh, these, these prayers were either written for women or later on uh, by women. He discovers a work, and he, no title page, he describes, I mean, he's really a bibliophile, he describes exactly what he's reading, a small pamphlet of 16 pages, and the top of the first page, the title appears, The Three Gates. A techina written by a pious woman, Sarah, the daughter of our doctor and Rav Mordechai, a blessed memory, grandson of the Rav and doctor Rav, Rabbi Mordechai, who is president of the Beit HaMidrash and the Holy Congregation of Brisk. The three refers to three commandments, chala, ceremonial uncleanliness, and lighting the, the lamps. A techina for new moon, uh, the third for the, uh, the holy days, yamim noraim, um, and uh, the prayer, as he argues, reveals a deep conviction of guilt, a fearful expectation of punishment, and a firm persuasion that an atonement and the merits of another are necessary to procure forgiveness. Like the Romanist, he argues, the rabbinic Jewess looks to the merits of the saints and trusts in the efficacy of purgatorial suffering. That's his own Christian take on this prayer. But believe it or not, he translates the entire Tichina into English, a hundred years before Chava Weisler did the same thing in her book, The Voices of the Matriarchs. So if Chava had only known, she could have already found an English translation of this text a hundred years earlier by a missionary. Um, but again, it is written out of a loving concern and affection and appreciation for the Jewish woman. Um, he criticizes the rabbis, but he ennobles uh, this text and this Jewish woman. Two more points I want to make about this, and then I, I want to move on to the last part of my talk. Um, the Reformed Jewish Connection I've mentioned already. Uh, let's go on to the next page. So here is the, is the introduction to the second edition of the Old Paths. Uh, and there you will see uh, uh, his claims about Reformed Judaism and so on. Uh, um, I'm trying to pick up so ignorant indeed. The Jews are a great and noble people and the majority ignorant of the details of the system by which they have been bowed down and misrepresented for centuries. So ignorant indeed that some zealously undertake a defense of the whole, maintain that rab rabbinism is a perfect model of, of charity and wisdom, and regard the old past as a mere elimination of common anti-Jewish prejudice. Such persons are requested to compare these papers with the articles in the Jewish periodical entitled the Israel the New and written by Dr. Samuel Holdheim, who was a radical reform rabbi. So he says, if you really want to see anti-Jewish stuff, read this rabbi, it's worse than my book. Uh, basically what he's saying. Uh, his claim about uh, having influenced the Reform Synagogue in London is complicated, but what is interesting is that in sketches he refers to three of the synods of Reformed Jews in the 19th century. And he says, look, they're doing all the right thing, they're attacking Rabbinic Judaism, but damn it, they don't go the whole way. Why don't they just see the light and stop playing games and, and uh, uh, uttering uh, these precious uh, platitudes about Rabbinic Judaism? 
they are wrong. All, so in other words, he becomes at a, at a certain point frustrated. The Reformed Jews are halfway there, but they haven't gone the whole way, so therefore uh, th there is something wrong with them. So the hypocrisy of what he calls Reformed catechisms. Uh, finally, 20, uh, next one. Uh, so this is back to Isaac Arobi de Castro, and this is really quite interesting here. So the way he attacks Isaac Arobi de Castro, uh, go on to the next page, um, is to um, history of that very city, that is Amsterdam, where Arabia professed Judaism, will afford proof of the assertion. When he fled from Spain and France, he found a refuge in toleration in another country possessing a Christian faith, just as Jews in England knew. But there, but about the same time, another Jew. Okay, here we are. In other words, the way to deal with Arabia de Castro is to pre present Oriel de Costa. Oriel de Costa, you recall, is the one that. Uh, uh, was basically, according to his autobiography, beaten up by the Mahmud, by the rabbis of Amsterdam in the 17th century. So about the same time another Jew who fled from Portugal found that the Judaism of Amsterdam refused that liberty of conscience which the Christianity of Amsterdam accorded. Gabriel, to be called, uh, or Oriel de Costa, came thither like Orobio with his mother and brothers to profess Judaism and soon find that rabbinism was not the religion of the Pentateuch. He dared to say so and was persecuted by the Jews with a hatred so intense so that which animated the inquisitors against Orobio. Um, and and he, he then uh, quotes this whole long text of Oriel de Costa. The point being <coughs> that the rabbis are also inquisitors from his perspective, that the rabbis are like the, the papists uh, that they are, Catholics and Jews are the same. They have this mediated tradition through their exclusive interpretation. And therefore, a true Judaism and a true Christianity can only come forth uh, within the context of uh, Protestant Christianity. All right, so I, I think I've said enough. I just want to say one, uh, two more things, uh, and then I'm coming, I'm moving us towards the next step. So that's my McCall. There's so much more to read by him uh, that it's almost overwhelming. Uh, but he is an, an interesting figure who, as you see, is clearly a person who has a deep affection and commitment to Jews and Judaism. At the same time, of course, he can overcome his hostility and frustration uh, in rabbinic Judaism, which he also knows intimately. Um, when he dies, uh, I just want to mention, uh, or in the 1860s, uh, he, he ends up to be less than a happy man. Uh, for two reasons, and uh, this has come to me recently, so I, I still have to fully develop it. Uh, his son, uh, in 1866, uh, three years after his death, publishes a work of letters that appeared in Jewish missionary publications, in which he claims that the London Society in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem has mistreated converts which he personally supervised. It seems that a controversy broke out between these converts and the consul general of the mission in Jerusalem, and they were, and the converts were put in jail. And he was incensed. This is not the way, if indeed we believe in Christian love, how is it possible to take converts and treat them so poorly? So he publicly reveals himself as an opponent of the Lund Society, in other words, taking an opposition only a few years before he dies, or almost at the point where he dies. The second uh, interesting aspect of uh, this story um, is that in 1860, uh, a work appears um, called, is it Essays, and uh, I can't find it now, um, uh, uh, I don't have it in front of me, a, a work of essays using history and archaeology to argue for a critical reading of the Bible written by Anglican theologians. In other words, the beginning of uh, a biblical criticism in a very serious way on the part of his own uh, uh, co-leaders within, uh, uh, within the church. He is incensed. And here he becomes so preoccupied in the last three years of his life, defending the sanctity of a, a very literal reading of the Old Testament, uh, that he loses sight of his Jews and his converts. In other words, at this point, the world around him seems to be crumbling. Instead of making progress, he seems to be losing progress now as the new reading of the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament has challenged the very core of his traditional Christian faith. So that, that's a, a very interesting ending to his story. Uh, 
Now I just want to talk about one more thing. So I talked about two mishumadim. I want to make sure you get your money's worth tonight. So I talked about one missionary and two mishumadim, Margoliot I mentioned, and of course, uh, Stanislaw Hoga. Now finally, the maskilim, the Jewish reaction. And this is what makes a full circle here and a complete conversation that I'm trying to reconstruct. What makes McCall uh, offensive, especially, uh, what makes the McCall offensive especially interesting for the intellectual and cultural history of 19th century Jewry is the remarkable Jewish response it elicited. Uh, next slide. Okay, these are some of them, there are more, but these are the most important. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, single out three. Uh, one is Rashi uh, Finn, uh, Samuel Joseph Finn, Darke Adonai, which is a manuscript. He intended to publish it. He dedicated it to Moses Montefiore, the great uh, financier, but uh, for some reason, uh, Moses uh, Montefiore never gave him the money to publish it. So it appears already to be published. It's sitting in the Hebrew University Library. But it's a text of about 350 pages against McCall. Um, the second is the Ribal, uh, Isaac Baer Levinson. Uh, and there are actually two works, Achia uh, Shiloni uh, and Zerubbabel, and these are large works. I, I haven't, I've only worked through about half of them. I still have to read the rest. But they are extraordinary texts uh, uh, in which these maskilim, these enlightened Jews, sitting in Vilna, for example, in the case of Levinson, are, are forced to respond to Mikol uh, in Hebrew and to argue with his, with his very serious argument. And the last one is Eliezer Zvifel Sadigor, uh, which uh, from Warsaw, which is very late. Look how many years after uh, 1837 when, when it came out. Were these effective? I'm not sure. And, and all, the other one that's really interesting is Raphael Kazan. Uh, he was a Sephardic rabbi in, 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 in Syria. Uh, and he wrote two works against McCall because apparently the work was translated into Ladino. And therefore, he felt the need to uh, respond, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and he does. Now, I have not studied all of these works yet, and that's why I'm working on. But I'm going through uh, at least the three important masculine. Um, three of the most important writers of the Haskalah uh, felt the need to pen significant and lengthy Hebrew responses. Uh, we've mentioned all three. I have quickly identified the six additional responses, and there are many more. Uh, I'm sorry, I said Raphael Kazan is the rabbi of Aleppo and Baghdad. Uh, besides these eight compositions, there are undoubtedly more. McCall's clever polemic would ultimately do less damage to the welfare of the Jewish community, the insidious uh, Damascus blood libel, as we said, on which McCall had published the sympathetic defense of the Jews. Yet like the impact of the Damascus affair, the McCall affair was highly publicized all over Europe and elicited an intense transnational response, as I've said, from Jewish leaders and intellectuals across the continent. Most fascinating is the role of the Maskilim in their counter arguments against McCall. They were the same Jewish critics of traditional Judaism who had challenged rabbinic authority, had objected to the excessive preoccupation of yeshiva students with Talmud study in the first place, at the expense of the acquisition of general culture, and had excoriated the parochialism and narrow-mindedness of their co-religionists due to Talmudic obscurantism and cultural isolation. These same critics of the Talmud now felt obliged to defend the latter to argue for the very humanity and moral sensitivity which McCall had argued was lacking in the Talmud in the first place. Defending traditional Jewish mores um, as embodied in the Talmud while criticizing its stranglehold on Jewish culture presented these same intellectuals with a delicate balancing act in which they strove to define their own Jewish identities, their own relationship to the ancient sources of their tradition, with a new bold and uh, strategy to transform Judaism at its core. The Jewish counterattacks against the English missionary thus represent thoughtful and nuanced articulations of what Judaism meant in the context of their own societies and how it could still retain its authentic values while reforming itself in the light of the new exigencies and challenges of the modern era. These texts are thus important as contributions to modern Jewish self-reflection important especially because they originate among Jewish thinkers beyond Germany and thus offer a different perspective from those, uh, from those of the better known German Jewish thinkers. Um, I would love to talk about them at greater length. Let me just say one or two words and then I'm gonna close. Uh, and I, forgive me if I spoke too long already. Um, they're all part of the moderate Haskalah. 
They are profound rabbinic scholars in their own right who read several languages and were influenced by German culture. Uh, in other words, the notion that Eastern European Jews were not connected to the West uh, is really proved wrong by many uh, sources, but especially by these texts themselves. Uh, all three of them, uh, that is uh, Zweifel, um, uh, Levinson, um, and, uh, and Fien, uh, were all uh, connected with each other, and we have their correspondence, so uh, they were very much in touch with each other. Um, what is interesting about their knowledge, they hold up uh, a, an ideal of what a rabbinic scholar is all about. And they try to distance themselves from McCall in arguing that a rabbinic scholar, and particularly this is Ribal speaking, needs not only to know uh, um, um, rabbinic texts, but he needs to know uh, Roman history. He needs to know Latin and Greek. Uh, they, they actually say that. Um, uh, too bad uh, uh, your professor um, uh, Seth Schwartz is not here tonight. In other words, to be another Seth Schwartz. In other words, the standards of rabbinic scholarship uh, is to, to know ancient history. And they spend a great deal of time speaking about ancient Christian history and comparing with ancient Jewish history. And thus to show the humanity of the rabbis uh, and the lack of humanity of the Christians who, uh, who treated uh, Jews poorly when they had the chance. Um, so what we have here is a, uh, and also a democratic Judaism. For them, uh, rabbinic texts are not the divine word of God, but are simply the interpretations of divine law, and therefore a notion of tradition. The most other interesting thing about this is that they do quote uh, Catholic authorities against Protestants and so on, but they spend a lot of time talking about uh, Nachman Krochmel, about Zechariah Frankel, um, they quote Frankel all the time. In other words, they seem to appear as if the, uh, conservative Judaism or traditional historical Judaism or the notion of tradition as set out in Darkeh HaMishnah of Zechariah Frankel seems to have influenced their own understanding of Judaism. In other words, we tend to see reform and conservative as a Western phenomenon and not as an Eastern phenomenon. But clearly they are reading these German Jewish thinkers and they're opting for a middle path which looks very close to Zechariah Frankel's version of, uh, of rabbinic tradition and rabbinic Judaism. Uh, I could say a lot more, but I, but I won't, but what is really interesting here is that uh, defenses of the Talmud on the part of Maskilim uh, and the revival of the Jewish-Christian debate in the 19th century, themes which you would think uh, uh, should not fall into a, such a modern era. For me, this is, you know, like, very modern, I start, you know, my first book is on the 15th century. Uh, so, I, but to find these motifs repeated over and over again in a different form suggests uh, uh, how interesting um, and how uh, enchanting this is. And also suggests that what we need to do, of course, is to consider more seriously um, the kind of self-reflection that emerges from these. And of course, this is going on now. Uh, uh, there are many Eastern European Jewish scholars who have done uh, serious work, continue to do serious work on this period, uh, including Michael Stanislavski, of course. Um, but clearly, uh, there is more to be done, and there are more texts to be studied, and the links between East and West, uh, and the relationship between, uh, and, and the place of the Christian polemic, or the Jewish-Christian polemic, in the context of the shaping of modern Judaism. These are all themes that come out so clearly uh, by reading uh, these responses. So if I've done nothing else, I hope I've convinced you that uh, I have a good topic, whether I'm <laughs> mad enough to complete it, uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I have found uh, a new engagement uh, with mingled identities, with this slippage between Judaism and Christianity. Um, and uh, I hope uh, it has entertained you at the very least uh, in the last hour or so. And forgive me for speaking so long. Thank you very much for listening to me. questions is too late. Um, I think we'll take a couple. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for, for joining us and for such an interesting lecture. I think we're all looking forward to the book now. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that I think it's so appropriate that this, this talk took place here in the Union Theological Seminary building, um, whose Burke Library holds a, trim, a huge uh, missionary collection. Right. Um, which was recently processed, actually, and is now available for use. Um, but um, let's let's take a couple of questions, if we if we have any. Otherwise, yeah, go ahead.
Well, first of all, uh, there is evidence that he did meet uh, Dr. Marx, the, uh, the rabbi of the Reformed Congregation in London, and that he did try to persuade him in his own understanding of Christianity, Judaism. And they had conversations. Um, and there is, in fact, evidence, one of uh, Marx's sermons, he kind of elaborates on, on on, on themes which uh, a Christian missionary would be happy to find. But besides this particular evidence of a, of a human connection, uh, what he was essentially seeing was that, you know, Reformed Jews were critical, of course, of, of the rabbinic hegemony and were arguing that individuals based on, on their own uh, uh, conscience had the right to choose what is meaningful and what is not meaningful about, uh, about Jewish observance. And particularly in looking at the radical reformers like Holdheim, I mean, Holdheim is really quite radical, who emphasized only the aspect of morality and the notion of a mission of Israel that is, here, mission doesn't mean the same thing as, as McCall meant, a mission of Israel being bringing the social values of Judaism to the world as a whole as being the ultimate goal of the Jew. In this, uh, 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 McCall felt very genuinely that there was a kinship between what he was saying about his own version of Protestant morality and, uh, and Protestant ethics and, and this reformed Jewish ethic. Um, so he pushed them. He said, so why don't you accept uh, my position? Uh, and he looked very carefully at their literature and particularly followed very carefully in detail the various uh, conventions of reform rabbis that were going on throughout the middle of the 19th century. Um, and he, he saw hypocrisy. In other words, he said, on the one hand, you criticize the rabbis. On the other hand, um, you will not take the leap. In other words, by giving it up entirely. You still quote the ethics of the fathers. You still refer to rabbinic homilies. Uh, you still have, you want to have one foot in and one foot out. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, so he became extremely frustrated in the end, and, uh, and he articulates uh, his animus towards them. Uh, I, I could say more, but I, I, I can't really go on with this. But, but clearly, um, it is a very interesting episode. Uh, my own argument, I, 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 it's irrelevant, but I happen to be a reform rabbi as well. Uh, not a very good one, but a, a reform rabbi. Not, not, not a very good Jew either, but, I'm, but anyway, anyway, no, forget about that. But uh, in any case, um, uh, so I, I don't like the idea of McCall uh, being in bed with Reformed Jews uh, at all, but I'm, but I'm simply an historian here and I'm reporting the way McCall saw it. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, uh, you know, Gerson Sholem argued that the, the Sabbateans and Reformed Jews were also connected. Everybody wants to put the Reformed Jews in, in with the bad guys, uh, or uh, McCall was not a bad guy unlike the Sabbateans. But in any case, um, it seems to me that um, indeed he tried very hard. He saw them as progress in his own mission, but he eventually became very frustrated when they did not embrace him totally. So that's a, a quick answer. Uh, I'll say we'll direct people over to the food and drink and perhaps we can continue the conversation. Okay. Over there so that